Welcome to the Weekly Lead. I'm Pastor Becky Tarabasi, and every week I want to encourage you to be a leader in your sphere of influence. Will you join me for this week's message? My husband is a book buyer. He buys books almost every day, new and used, and they come to our front door. Well, I was outside, and this is the strange part of my story. I was outside looking at my husband's tomato plants because there was a little squirrel that has been attacking them, actually eating them. And so he has rigged up a number of different contraptions to keep the squirrel out of his tomato plants. As I was standing there looking, nothing exciting because there was no squirrel at the time, I turned around and in the middle of the day on a table was a book. And I have never seen this book. I've never read this book. And I thought, how did this book get out here? And to this day, I still haven't gotten a straight answer out of my husband, (laughs) except to say he wanted it to get a little sun. And Honestly, I'm sure that's not the answer, but I have no idea. He said he's going to tell us all on Sunday when he preaches about it. But the book is called On This Rock I Stand, and it's sermons by Vance Havner. Vance Havner was a friend of Billy Graham's from North Carolina, and that means 20th century, mid-20th century preacher. But his book is all about prayer and revival. And of course, I'm inclined to read anything like that. In fact, that afternoon, I read the entire book. It wasn't that big. It was all his sermons, but it coincided with a sermon that I would give on the prophet Jeremiah and the apostle Paul. And really, Paul himself was a prophet who, in the same way Jeremiah was asked, had to say something and pray something for his generation. And I believe whether you're a parent or a spouse, a care professional, a coach, a business person, a friend, sibling, administrator, minister, or teacher, God is calling you to say something and to pray something for your generation. Vance Havner aptly aptly preached in the 20th century. And I hope as you hear this quote, Ask God if this is you. God is on the lookout for a person who will listen. He or she must not only be quiet enough to get a message from God, but brave enough to give it. If you are uh, following along in the Change Your Life Daily Bible, always in October, you read the book of Jeremiah. It follows Isaiah, and Isaiah was himself uh, a wonderful prophet. He was given a probably more beautiful, (laughs) uh, lovely uh, prophetic word to give to the people. Jeremiah, his call was a little different, and it may be more likely that our call in our generation Uh, to our sphere of influence is similar. It started out this way in Jeremiah 1, 4. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and, and appointed you as a prophet to the nations. The word prophet in Hebrew is nabi, which means speaker, spokesperson. Jeremiah was appointed by God and set apart meaning holy, before he was even born, he was set apart and appointed to speak to the nations. The Lord said to him, I've called you. (laughs) Jeremiah said, I'm too young. And the Lord replied, or you could fill in anything there. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm too, I'm not educated enough. I'm not in the right circles. I don't have enough money. I'm not a man. I'm not a woman. The Lord replied, don't say 
I'm too young for you must go. And I, I pray that you hear this today. You must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people for I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord have spoken. Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, look, I've put my words in your mouth. Today, I appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. Some you must uproot and tear down, destroy and overthrow, and others you must build up and plant. Get up, prepare for action, go out and tell them everything I tell you to say, and don't be afraid of them, or I will make you look foolish in front of them. For see, today I've made you a strong, fortified city that cannot be captured, like an iron pillar or a bronze wall. You will stand against the whole land, the kings and officials, priests and people of Judah, and they will fight you, but they will fall, for I am with you, and I will take care of you. I remember reading these words uh, early in my public speaking career when I was invited or appointed to pay, to speak for 20,000 high school kids in the Washington, D.C. Convention Center. I was very, 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 very nervous, but I believe God was going to speak through me to the young generation, and my speech was about prayer, the power of prayer. And I believe God had directed me to research prayer, study prayer, become a powerful communicator about prayer. And so my world, my sphere of influence spoke on love, sex, and dating, which was way more fun probably to put together the whole talk and, and more likely to be asked to speak somewhere because of a talk if you were doing love, sex, and dating. But no, I, I had been given the one on prayer. But I believe God wants us um, not to fear an audience, especially of students, what their reaction might be, what they want to hear, but to think more about God's purpose for having you say something on his behalf. In Jeremiah's case, he was a prophet to the nation. But I want to encourage you to see the sphere of influence around you, the strangers <laughs> sitting next to you or um, your child or your children's friends who are in your home or your coworkers who kind of hang out over by your desk, I encourage you that when God asks you to say something on his behalf, don't be afraid of that person's response. Don't second guess yourself by their reaction. Don't water down what God asks you to say, and don't avoid saying it. Charles Stanley said, obey God and leave the consequences up to him. You know, just for the record, Jeremiah was a prophet, and as his book describes, and today's commentaries agree, he spoke on God's behalf, but was almost always ignored, often in prison, and regularly mocked by the proud religious leaders for his messages to the people. And really, so it was in Paul's day. As you're reading in the New Testament, Paul's letters, many from prison, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, um, and then the others to the churches. He was not only saying something, he was praying something. And when he was saying something to the church, he was always preaching the gospel, calling out sin, exposing false teachers and suggesting there was a high call, high standards for God's leaders. You could, you could translate that into today. You know, he was in prison for those things because he was speaking on behalf of God. People who do that often fall into that category like Jeremiah. He got more mud and mire than he got anything. Nonetheless, 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 both Jeremiah and Paul were faithful and compelled to say something to 
and they often wrote to the holy people of God, to whom God was writing then and now. You know, Paul said, I'm confident God will complete the work he began in you. He wanted to convey to new people, new believers in Jesus Christ, that they could have confident assurance that God could be trusted. I love Charles Spurgeon, 19th century English preacher, his quote, probably inspired from Paul's writings in Philippians, under no conceivable circumstances ever give place for an instant to the dark thought that God is not true and faithful to his promises. Paul also said in Philippians 1, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. You know, he was adamant that honoring God every day of your life till the very end will leave a legacy that your children and your children's children will emulate. I encourage you at this moment, think of the people who did that. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Corey Ten Boom, others. We think of all the people who give up after two years, after four years, either faith or marriage or or pursuing, you know, uh, a person to come to God. Don't ever give up. Paul also said to the Philippians, and this is probably something we should all hold on to, no matter how desperate our times. You see, Paul wrote this from prison. Whatever is true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and praiseworthy, think on and dwell on these things. So when you say something on behalf of God, even to strangers, I believe God wants you in that moment, hear me now, I I really mean this, to inspire them, to stand strong in their faith, to be courageous in their calling, and to give them hope and confidence to destroy despair and hopelessness. Give them hope that God is able to change their lives, that God wants to assure them that he is for them. I recently sat on an airplane with a young man. I kid you not, you know my story. You know that I'm the child of an alcoholic, the grandchild of an alcoholic. I now have 45 years of sobriety. I've spent uh, most of my uh, first 20 years in ministry speaking to high school and college students all across America about this story. And today you wish you could say drug addiction, alcoholism, uh, sexual uh, immorality is not the issue it was, 40 years ago, but unfortunately, it's equal or worse. So I sat next to a young man on an airplane. And in this particular case, I was in the middle seat and I had work to do, homework to do. I'm getting my doctorate in ministry. And he happened to kind of be over, like looking over my shoulder, reading things like meaning of life, purpose for life. And I'm in a chaplaincy program where you would, um, be encouraging uh, men and women who are struggling. Your role would be the spiritual uh, encouragement to them as a chaplain. Well, I I don't know why, except God had it planned out. In fact, he told me later that he was sitting in the front row and went to someone and just said, I I, I can't sit here. I need more leg room. And he was given the seat next to me in the exit aisle exit window. I was in the middle. And about two hours into a four-hour flight, he tapped me on the shoulder. And I'm not kidding you. Um, He said to me, do you believe that God can help someone quit drinking? That he could do it in a day? And I literally thought, this kid does not know who he just sat next to. And obviously, God does. And what was the first thought on the top of my mind? I'm supposed to say something. That's the point of this podcast. 
you are supposed to say something. As many times a day as God prompts you, puts you in a place where someone needs him, you are to say something on behalf of God to encourage, to bring them back, to share your story, to give a scripture, offer a prayer. You are to say something. So of course, all of you who know my story know exactly where I started. Yes, I do believe that. And in fact, um, that is exactly what happened to me. You see, my dad was an alcoholic and I was an alcoholic at a very young age. And it was a janitor who, when I was suicidal and broken after attending a court hearing for hitting a car while drinking, said to me that just ask God to come into your life, forgive you for your sins ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit. And I told him the very exact words of my prayer with a perfect stranger on August 26th, over 45 years ago. And then I said, I'd love to give you a Bible because that's what the janitor did for me. He not only said something, he gave me God's words to read daily. He was bold and he wasn't afraid to say, if you're a sinner, And I wasn't afraid to respond. Oh man, am I a sinner? I didn't say, Hey, no, I really am. Okay. I'm doing what everyone else is doing. I thought those things. I thought I am doing what every one of my friends is doing, drinking, blacking out, passing out, living with my boyfriend, taking drugs, smoking dope, selling a little bit of marijuana on the side. I mean, I was completely gone in terms of fulfilling the purpose in my life that God had for me. I had walked away from God, turned away from God, lived like the world, loved the world. And the person who was speaking to me, this janitor, he didn't offend me by telling me that I had a sin problem. He gave me a solution to confess my sins, to be forgiven, to take on, uh, to take Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit into my heart and live a brand new life beginning in that moment. That is my why. That is my motivation. I pray today you have a motivation to say something and that it would be that when God puts someone in your life, whether they are family, friends, foe, stranger, you would follow the prompting of the Lord. You don't have to be an educator, a pastor. Uh, you, you need to be one who has been touched by God. You know, that's, that's all Jeremiah was. He was touched by God. Paul was touched by God. They, um, realized they could do nothing without God. They, they bent, then they bent their knees and bowed their hearts and, and, and called upon God to help them and change them. And, and then they were compelled to take the good news, the gospel to everyone. Some, obviously, they were preachers. But for anyone, everyone, that great commission that Jesus gave us is go and tell others the good news. So who can you encourage? Grab a piece of paper, write it down. Who is on your heart? Write this very moment. Who are you to call? Who are you to make an appointment with? Is it your closest friend from, from high school or childhood? Is it a, a family member, a coworker? Don't be afraid to talk about sobriety and sexual purity. Don't be afraid to call them um, and ask if they want to come to church with you. Don't be afraid to talk about forgiving people who've hurt them. You see, unforgiveness is one of the key mental health problems uh, in America. Resentment is they have discovered um, one of the key components of substance abuse and suicidal ideation. Resentment and these very uh, contributors to our health problems can be solved through prayer, asking forgiveness reconciliation, renunciation of sin. I know that God wants to reach you to say something and to pray something. You see, when we pray something, 
for others. It's the most powerful, proactive resource you have as a Christian. I love Leonard Ravenhill's uh, quote. He's a 20th century praying leader who said, the people who pray most accomplish most. I want to encourage you to not be intimidated by those who don't want to hear your message. Remember, there's something that you are to say that could change a person's life, the trajectory of their life in the least, right? Paul said in Philippians 4, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he's done. I want to encourage you, even as you read through the rest of the New Testament this year, that prayer is not wishing and worrying and complaining about people. But then when you pray something for people, you are asking God to change the trajectory of their lives. Charles Spurgeon, again, that prince of preachers, said, you may not know why God deals with you so strangely, but never think that he is unfaithful for an instant. Never cease your prayers. No time is wrong for prayer. The glare of daylight should not tempt you to cease, and the gloom of midnight should not make you stop your cries. Like Paul said, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert and thankful mind. I'd like to close by asking you to say something in your sphere of influence today, tomorrow, and every day on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'd like to pray something with you and for you. I pray that you would allow the Holy Spirit of the living God to come into your life, that you would ask him to forgive you for your sins, that you would start fresh today, that you would begin to be alert on the lookout for people who need something that God has asked you to say to them. May God's Holy Spirit daily and hourly fill you with him, his presence and his power to say something and pray something. Amen. Amen. I hope you've been encouraged by this message, and I hope you join me weekly for the Weekly Lead Podcast. Meanwhile, follow me daily on Instagram. The link is in the bio with everything you need to become a weekly leader.